Hello, I'm Tom Long. Welcome to Island Meditations. This week, the scenery I'm sharing is from the quaint village of Edenton on the inner banks of the North Carolina coast. Did you ever wonder what the Apostle Paul would say to a good church? <laughs> if you attend a church that you consider to be a good one like I do, maybe what Paul said to a good church back in his day, he would say to our churches. But before we get into that, do you know what makes this Sunday so special? Those of us living in the United States have barely had time to digest our Thanksgiving dinner and BAM! <laughs> it's the first Sunday of Advent. So, Happy New Year! This Sunday marks the beginning of Year C in the lectionary. The first Sunday of Advent begins our countdown to the Advent in history, our remembrance of the birth of the long-awaited Messiah. But as Paul does in our reading, it is also a time to celebrate the majesty of Christ's second coming. And we do this to better understand the mystery of the advent of Christ being alive in us right now. A great advent tradition, practiced in many churches, is the lighting of the advent candles. This Sunday, we will light the candle of hope, then the one of love, then the one of joy, and lastly, the one of peace. Then, on Christmas Eve, we light the Christ candle in the middle of it all. <laughs> in Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians, he weaves hope, love, joy, and peace together for those of us looking forward to the day of Christ's return. Our reading starts in chapter 3, verse 9 of 1 Thessalonians. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Paul begins by giving thanks for their church. Tip of the hat to Thanksgiving, y'all. I hope we all remembered to be thankful for our church families. In other places in this epistle, Paul heaps praise on this church too. For example, in chapter two, verses 19 through 20, he wrote, for what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. I like what Reverend Wayne Cordero said a couple of weeks ago. God loves us just the way we are, but that doesn't mean he wants us to stay the way we are. The church in Thessalonica made Paul crazy happy, <laughs> but that didn't mean he didn't see room for growth. After threading hope, love, joy, and peace through his letter, Paul here doubles down on love. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. He doesn't say he wants them to start loving, he says he wants their love to increase and overflow. After all, Jesus said that love was the way we would be known as his disciples. Remember what Jesus said when he was asked which was the greatest of the Old Testament commandments? In Matthew 22 verses 37 through 40 we read, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Usually when I think about what Jesus answered, I think of how the first four of the Ten Commandments are oriented toward God, and the last six are oriented toward how we treat each other. But this week, that phrase connecting the two commandments really spoke to me, and the second is like it. How is loving our neighbor like loving God? As soon as I asked the question, it struck me. Just a few chapters later in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, Jesus separates the sheep from the goats. And what was the difference? The difference was how they had treated the hungry, the thirsty, and the outcast. Jesus said, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And then in contrast to that, he also says, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, 
you did not do for me, in verse 45. When we remember that we are all created in the image of God, we see that to ignore or disrespect or mistreat people is to ignore or disrespect or mistreat God. When we have mercy on people and show them love, we are loving God. The Bible goes all in on love. Jesus told us not just to love the people that love us, but to love our enemies. In the same chapter of Leviticus that told us to love our neighbor, in verse 18, we have an example of what that looks like in verses 33 through 34. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. The Apostle John wrote that if we claim to love God but hate people, we're lying about loving God. Loving God cannot be separated from loving people made in His image. God loves the world. <laughs> Maybe we fall short in this area. Maybe we're strong in this area like the Thessalonian church. But either way, as we start Advent, we have room to grow, to be more loving. As Paul put it, may your love increase and overflow. As Christ comes to live in us, to live in our churches, may he expand our capacity to show his love for all people. Amen.